Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Today, I have a very special, very important advocate, legend in the industry. She is a self-proclaimed fat girl who is all about body positivity and changing the way that the adult industry sees women's bodies. And she's really been a pioneer in this space. And I've wanted to interview her for a really long time. So I'm so excited that she's finally here. Miss April Flores. Hi, how are you? I, I feel great after that introduction. Thank you. Good, because I was I winged that one. I mean, oh. I said all the things I wanted to say, but sometimes when I wing it, I I screw it up. So. It was perfect. Oh, good, good. <laughs> I just have to tell you, I love your hair. The, Thank the, you. The ringlets are on point. So good. Thank you. Yeah. I love it when podcasts start about me. Yeah. <laughs> so if you want to just like talk about how great I look for like a so little while longer. let's talk about your hairspray. <laughs> yeah. So like I know we're here to interview you, but if you want to talk about me, we can do that. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Thank you. I finally gave up on like straightening my hair. And yes, I have to add ringlets in a little bit, but this is mostly my curl. Beautiful. So Yeah. Like I have my curl like under here, like the back is kind of straight-ish, so... Yeah. yeah. It's it's nice. Uh, mine is, I, I get that too. It's like an inconsistent, like this side tends to be a little bit flatter. This side is super curly, but then I have to add more curls this side. So it's okay. like, you feel my pain. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it's not like one consistent curl. And I will probably do a side pony at some point during this interview. Oh, okay. We're going to get like a hairstyle change. Oh, awesome. <laughs> I love that. Um, so April, you just spoke at SXSW on Sunday. Yeah. South by Southwest. Um, yeah, I was on a panel about uh, sex tech tech trends in the adult industry, mm -hmm. and it was really cool. I was super nervous because I've done panels before, but not for an audience that wasn't adult based or or at a convention that wasn't specifically aimed towards adult entertainment. Um, this is you know South by, so it's you know music and movies, and uh, we were there at the the tech kind of branch of it or time of it. Um, so I just wasn't sure how that audience would receive us, mm -hmm. but it was like really warm reception. Everyone was very curious. Um, I, I didn't experience any horror phobia, so it was it was great. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I spoke at um, uh, I've spoken at in the city, which is a music festival in Manchester. Okay, and I think that the music industry and the adult industry, there's often like we see a lot of crossover there, and yeah. I think like artists in general tend to be more accepting of the adult industry. So I'm not surprised that you got like a warm reception there. Yeah, nice. <laughs> um, did you feel that, like, did you have any specific feedback on people, from people when you finished? And also like, what specifically did you talk about? What I spoke about was just how I've been using, you know, platforms specifically during pandemic mm -hmm. to be super privileged and earn my income from home. Mm -hmm. um, and how I have had to alter my work being for, I started in 2005. So I you know you were around and it was, you know, we would get hired, go do our shoot, have a nice check and go home and, you know, like just chill. But now, as you know, probably your viewers know that um, performers have to wear all of the hats, you know, casting, makeup, wardrobe, lighting, filming, editing, promoting, all of that. You're fine. Okay. I just, so I can keep track of time. <laughs> okay. Sorry, go ahead. Um, marketing, all of the, the, the technical. So it's, it's a lot. And it was a huge shift for me to go from just like having, you know, showing up and just doing a good job and, and learning all these skills, which I'm really happy I've been able to learn because YouTube and, um, you know, other friends uh, being super generous with what they know. Um, but yeah, that's kind of what I was talking about. My co-panelists were talking about um, equity, um, the future of tech in sex industry, um, like with NFTs and AR and just all of these uh, letters that mean stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's just, uh, it's exciting. I think it's an exciting time for everyone around technology and metaverse and um We'll just see what's going to happen. Yeah, it's so interesting because, you know, kind of same, I pretty much was speaking on the same thing oh. at this festival. And this was, oh, this is where I met my ex-husband. So I was like 30. This was 13 years ago. Wow. 
this was 13 years ago. And I was talking about the adult industry being on like the verge of tech. And the whole idea was like, what could the music industry learn from the adult industry? And I think back then we were talking about websites, just like basic, like solo girl websites. It's so funny to think about how far we've come. Yeah, how far we've come. Um, it, it does involve a lot more work for, for the performers or models or however they want to um, classify. I just call myself a performer. Mm -hmm. um, it's so much more work, but at the same time, we have full autonomy. We're not waiting for the big companies that are still around, because a lot of them are not, mm. um, to say, okay, you have the right look. We'll hire you for one project a year or whatever. Like we have direct access to our, our fan base. Mm -hmm. They have a uh, like direct access to us and like telling us what type of content they want. Mm -hmm. They can order customs. Like the access to performers is wild. <laughs> yeah. Do you prefer it the way it is now? <laughs> I do in a sense. And I, I miss the old days. I love my fans and also I'm a very private person. So the access is what was hard for me to kind of like acclimate to. Mm. Um, I like it now. You know, I have a relationship with a lot of these people. Um, but a tip for anyone that <laughs> if you want to get your performer, your favorite performers attention, pay them, like send them money, send them wish, go to their wish list. It's not hard to find like, the way to stand out is to support us. Like this mm. is a job and I know that it looks effortless, you know, like we're just fucking or masturbating or doing whatever. Um, and you have this, like the, the fans have this access to us, but I think it can, can be easy for people to go really like believe the fantasy aspect of it and just think that we're just around and fucking and filming all day. And no, we got bills and uh, you know, so this is our livelihood and um, pay for your porn. I pay for some of your porn because I think, you know, asking someone to pay for all porn is not realistic. But yeah, if there's uh, someone you, you really love their work, support them financially. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> is it, you, you brought up an interesting point because it is we're in this new place where there is this kind of weird line between like your personal life and your professional life, right? Because now that people have access to you personally and you're in the intimate parts of your life, you know, you filming from home, they feel like they know you better, which has been, you know, the, um, which has been what has made OnlyFans and other platforms like that so successful. And then also, but also like recognizing that it is a job. So yes, like you are having this personal connection with the fans and like, yes, like we do like love and appreciate our fans and like we do care for them in certain, in, you know, certain respects. And, but also like it is a job and, and I, I hear you on that. And I think every other model can also relate to like, you will get that one fan that will join for the basic subscription price, which is usually pretty low for most people. Uh -huh. Like mine's $6.99 a Same. month. I went Same. to Starbucks yesterday and I got one fucking oat milk shake and espresso <laughs> for $6. And I thought to myself, like, this is a month of my OnlyFans. But anyways, my point <laughs> is, and then they want so much of your time and they send you all these messages, these long messages, these long stories, and they don't buy any of your locked DMs and they don't tip. And it's hard to be like, hey, it's not that like, I don't want to talk to you, but you have to recognize like there is a value for my time. And I, I there are other people who recognize that and, and will spend more money to engage with me more. And I'm going to prioritize that person because I simply have to like this. I'm not on 24 seven. I do have other things to do. And it, you know, in the end it is a job. And I think a lot of people have a hard time recognizing that sex work is a job. And I think that that's part of the stigma that we fight every day, right? A million percent. Yes. That everything you just said, exactly that. Um, yeah. Just, if you want to get noticed, just fucking send us some, some money. Mm -hmm. I, I hate to break it, like make it so like transactional, but you know, it is, this is work. <laughs> it is. I mean, I don't, you know, see my therapist who's not cheap and <laughs> talk to her for an hour and then be like, you know, like I'll pay next time. <laughs> yeah. Do I have to pay you? And it's like, and it's not that she doesn't care about me, mm -hmm. but like, this is her job. And I think that that's, it's yeah, it's a weird line sometimes. And I, and I do find that it is a, 
a struggle for some people and, and I struggle with that too. So I imagine that that you kind of feel the same thing. Yeah, so. I'm, I'm glad you relate. Also, you did touch upon like shooting at home, specifically during the pandemic. I live in a one bedroom. It's it's really cute, you know, but I was like, I don't want to expose my bedroom, my living room, my kid, like everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I just keep the camera just on my bed, not in, everywhere mm -hmm. in my room and my couch on my couch. So those are like the two kind of setup um, setups that I have. But, you know, with saying all that, like I still feel super privileged to do this totally. as work uh, yeah. because I feel like sex workers are healers. Um, I feel like we enable like we help people um explore their sexuality explore certain fantasies feel safe enough to do this to um you know I had a fan just come out as bisexual and he really thanked me for um you know I didn't really do much but just validate him you know but uh, people people need this especially around sexuality um so I feel like we have um beyond pleasure I feel like we do have a really important role in society and that's why you know this this work is not going to end even if they shut down all the websites like people will find a way to you know engage in sexuality I yeah and I think that also because of the industry that we work in and because we're you know surrounded by sexually open people all the time we forget that so many people who you know, come to your personal platforms and engage with you like this person who just came out as bisexual, like to, to like, I think like, oh, okay. Yeah, of course. Who cares that you're bisexual? But we forget that so many people come from these really, um, strict backgrounds and they live in a space where they don't feel like they can express who they truly are. And to be able to feel safe and vulnerable with sex workers, because like clearly like, you know, sex workers are super open about who they are, right? They're almost like, it's almost like one of the most vulnerable jobs that you can take. So I think people feel safe opening up about their sexuality with sex workers. And I think that that makes so much sense that like healing can come from that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I do agree that it's a very vulnerable job, you know, like just, just getting down to the, the like meat of it. We're like fully exposed sexually having like exposing wide open pussy lips or just the moment of pleasure. Um, so yeah, it, it, it is vulnerable. And also I love it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about, um, how you started in the industry. How did you get to where you are today? Um, so I started in 2005 and at the time my late husband, Carlos Betts and I were working on a book called fat girl, which was ultimately published in 2013. Um, but we were working, we were really inspired by these these two books called Porn Art One and Porn Art Two. Um, the photographer was Domain, I think. I don't know. It's a French artist, and he had his muse. And um, it was basically the books were just her. She was a main subject, and she was doing all these different like nude poses or flashing or fucking. Um, and we were just really inspired by that. So we were like, let's just work on our own project. He was a photographer and filmmaker, and I was his, you know, his muse. And the camera was the one consistent element in our relationship of 13 years. So um, we were compiling images for that book and he shot Belladonna at the time for a Japanese magazine. And she saw my photo in his portfolio and she liked my look. So we met and we proposed to her like, do you want to shoot for this project, the book project? And she was super ahead of her time. And she was like, no, I only shoot for my own stuff. But do you want to do a sex scene with me? And I was like, uh, what? <laughs> I had never thought of doing something like that. Like, I didn't really even watch porn. Um, well, I was like, fuck it. Yeah, like, let me try this. Let me just see what happens. And, like, uh, it'll be, like, this funny secret I have. You know, like, oh, I was in a porn once. Ha ha. Mm -hmm. um, but I actually really loved it. Um, I... A lot of our peers at the time were also directors, performers, photographers. So it wasn't super outside of my like uh, circle of mm -hmm. of people that I knew. But um, yeah, I had never considered doing porn. So yeah. Uh, so then after that, my friends were hiring me, and it just it happened really naturally and slowly. Mm. So I mean, for your first scene to be with like a legendary name like Belladonna, that's pretty. That's pretty amazing. How how was the scene itself? Like, how were you feeling? Like, 
walking into it and then how did you feel afterwards? I love this question. Um, walking into it, I was really nervous. I had been modeling for still photos and some video for uh, five years at that time. So I was comfortable being in front of the camera, but um, I never had sex with a woman. <laughs> so, oh, <wow>. yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, she's she's such a pro and she kind of led the scene. I haven't watched it in several years, mm -hmm. but um, she led the scene. I just... You know, we started kissing and I was just like, let me just dive in, eat her pussy. Like, mm -hmm. I know, I know that feels like on me. So I think I did okay, but she, she definitely led the scene. I was fucking her ass with a glass toy at some point And I was just like, oh my God, this is going to break in her ass. Oh my, I was like so <laughs> worried. <laughs> but yeah, I think it was cute. And then when I left, I just felt so like liberated and empowered and just like, what the fuck just happened? That's so cool. Um... But yeah, like my, my next projects didn't come to like, you know, several months after that. I'm not the I'm not the performer who was like when I turn 18, like I'm going to do this or like have this goal, like I'm going to be a porn star. Like my route here was um, very curious and artistic. And that's just my route here. Mm -hmm. That's that's why, like when people ask, like, how do you start? I'm just like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Google. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's got everybody because, you know, the origin story is kind of what I ask almost everybody and everyone's is, is often so different. Um, some people jump right in and they love it and they go right into like doing super hardcore stuff and they're all about it. Some people jump right in and they find that they're in over their heads and it's not suited for them. And, and some people have the privilege of being able to start slow and be able to be selective about what they do and, and only doing scenes when they're ready for it. Exactly. And that's the word. It's privilege. I had my husband. I had my friends. Um, I was able to be selective. I had another job at the time. So I wasn't, you know, like survival sex working. Mm -hmm. um, so fully privileged entrance. Yeah. And then how did your husband, like, how did you guys communicate about this? Um, was he very much involved in your decisions moving forward in the adult industry? Was he supportive? Yeah, he was like my my everything in all the ways. So he was like my manager, my uh, PR person, my agent, <laughs> all of the things. So he would advise me like, no, you don't want to shoot with that person or yeah, like do this. It'll be good for like whatever. And and like I said, I had a lot of friends who were doing projects at the time. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, I was able to take it, you know, project by project. And also like internally, like I had this moment where I was like, okay, I'm going to, if I'm going to continue doing this, what is the reason besides like being an exhibitionist, besides loving to do sexual things and get paid? Like, I love that part still to this day. Mm -hmm. um, what is going to be my, my, like, why am I con going to continue doing this? And that's when, you know, I was like, you know what? I want to represent a fat body, a fat sexual body on camera and um, to empower other fat people to feel like they're worthy of sexuality and being desirable. Which is amazing and I think is such a great mission and such a teachable moment for someone like me, you know, who came into this industry. I started working in porn in 2000, 1999, when I was 20. When was I 20? It was a long time ago. Anyways, um, and, you know, I've just seen such a change in the way that we accept and embrace diversity. And that did not exist when I first started, you know, and especially with, you know, my mom, Suze Randall, who, you know, I mean, to be fair, like her time was different and, you know, she was picky about who she shot. And I, I think like, saw the way that, you know, women's bodies were like, okay, they need to be like this weight, this size. And I internalized that even mm -hmm. though I wasn't on that side of the camera at all at the time, like I internalized that. And, um, that, you know, gave me like struggles with my body image that I still have to this day. I'm better about it, but I still have it to this day. So like meeting someone like you who can like fully embrace and like love their body. And I had an interview with Carla Lane too, same thing. Like it's, it's very inspiring for me and, you know, for women everywhere, um, you know, not women just necessarily who like would call themselves fat, but just like women who just like, we seek this perfectionism that is just like so self-destructive, I think. Yeah. Um, porn, porn is part of media, whether people like to admit it or not. Um, so I think representation is super important, like what you just said, like just seeing other people embrace their, their body as it is. 
Um, yeah, so I, I saw a huge value in continuing to do the work, the sex work, um, just to be a representation. Um, but, you know, I'm like, I'm very light skinned. It's like we have so there's so many layers to um, what is perceived as beautiful. But um, yeah, I felt like my my fat body fucking and enjoying sexual pleasure um, would be really impactful and it has been um to to all all different types of people yeah and also i wanted to challenge people if they didn't want to see me fucking then you know like not that they would but it can be an opportunity to for them to like examine why or just to like fuck with their head a little bit like you don't like it was a lot different now it's 2022 we're talking about the early 2000s mm. um the image the 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 mainstream cultural idea of what is perceived as beautiful has shifted. Back then, when I would just look up BBW, everyone looked the same. Mm -hmm. They were all blonde. They personally, they they all looked exactly the same. So I was like, well, there is a need for someone that looks a little bit different in this like a uh, genre. Let me let me do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. All right, guys, we're going to take a quick commercial break and we're going to come back. We're going to talk more about um, April's advocacy and um, the BBW genre and how it can kind of apply to all of us. Um, so hang tight. We'll be right back. Holly Randall Unfiltered is brought to you by Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve is like the biggest online sex toy retail store. And in fact, they don't just offer sex toys. They also have movies, they have lingerie. They basically have anything sexy that you could be looking for. Now they have an incredible offer. Get 50% off of any one item when you go to adamandeve.com. But that's not where it ends. So not only will you get 50% off any one item, they will also load up 10 free gifts for you on top of that. You will get six free movies, a free mystery pack that includes an item for him and a special toy for her and something we know you'll both enjoy, plus free shipping. Now that's a lot of free stuff, but you can only get this offer if you go to adamandeve.com and use my code HOLLY. That's adameve.com, use code HOLLY, for 50% off of any one item plus 10 free gifts. All right, guys, we are back. Um, so yeah, April, I just wanted to talk a little bit more about um, embracing the word fat. Like, so the word fat, I think most people recognize it as having a negative connotation, um, but you are embracing that word. And so tell me a little bit about your decision on that and like, what does that mean to you now? Okay. Um, so at, at going back to the, the book, the, the project that eventually became the published book, Fat Girl, uh, while we were shopping it around, you know, we had so many images, we took it to so many publishers and we were like, well, we need a name for this project, you know? So, you know, we're thinking, thinking, and I was like, fat girl. I, I know that those two words separately have a lot of power and, and evoke emotion in a lot of people. And together it's just like, whoa, fat girl, you know? Um, and I was picturing like it being in a bookstore, like on the, you know, the spine, like the, I just thought it would be really like, it would draw people in to be mm -hmm. like, what is this? Mm -hmm. Or what is this? Cause normally that's not something that's celebrated. Right. Yeah. So I think then is kind of when I, I, reclaim the word mm -hmm. so this must have been about like 2008 nine um because like I said we were shopping it around forever um yeah so that's that's when my my relationship to the word fat changed and yeah growing up fat is like a really bad ne ne negative connotation um, word, but it, to me, it's just a descriptor. Like mm -hmm. I'm not skinny, <laughs> you know, I have red hair, you know, this is a black tablecloth. Um, so it's, um, you know, words only carry power if you let them. And if someone wants to put me down, that's whatever. That's, that's about them. It's not about me. Yeah. yeah that's so true. People's judgment of you reflects so, so much more about them than yes. it does about you. And, and, and you're right. Uh, words do only have that kind of power if you allow them to. Did you ever feel like, how was it growing up? Did you feel ashamed when you grew up? And did you ever feel like when you first started in the adult industry, did you ever feel like 
the pressure to like lose weight and change your body or were you always staunchly like comfortable in your skin? No, no. Um, so no, I, I've never felt pressure in this industry to lose weight. Sometimes, you know, weight fluctuates. And sometimes when I lose some weight, people are like, you're getting too skinny. <laughs> <laughs> um, also comments about other people's bodies, not cool. <laughs> but, um, no, growing up. Yeah. I, I had lots of body shame, um, I idealized a skinny body, um, like I think a lot of people did and still do. Um, it wasn't until I was like in my early 20s. So my weight was fluctuating all the time. In my early 20s, I was in like a few really bad relationships. So I stopped eating. You know, I was um, broke, going to college, you know. So I just, I lost a lot of weight. And I was, you know, perceptive to people around me, just how different everyone was treating me. And, um, at the same time I met this guy who was like, he was always happy. And I was just like, why is he so happy? Like what's going on? So I talked to him and he was like, happiness is a choice. Like you have to like choose every day to be happy. This is my philosophy back then, early twenties. Like I, I feel, I would have like a little discussion with my 22 year old self as like my 45 year old self. But, um, Back then I was like, oh shit, it's like in my head. So as I started to slowly gain weight, people around me were like freaking out. And I was just like, you know what? I'm not going to base my happiness on um, my weight because even when I was skinny, I was just like, damn, I still have all the same problems. I just have my body's different, but I'm still having like these, my life didn't become instantly easier. Mm -hmm. So all these things happened concurrently. And I was just like, okay, well, I'm going to be try to be happy with just how I am. It's crazy, right? When we, I, I, I think of the same things. When I was in high school, I was like, you know, significantly lighter than I am now. And I remember thinking I was fat then <laughs> and thinking I had big thighs then. And then before I had a baby, I thought I was heavy and I was, I'm 10 pounds heavier now. And I thought I was fat then. Like it just never happy, like no <laughs> matter what. Well, this diet this is a diet culture industry. Like they they make money off of feeding us lies that make us feel insecure. So, oh shit, I gotta like, what? I don't know. I don't subscribe to diet culture, so I'm not sure. Like I have to join Noom or Zoom or whatever the, the name is. Like, can I cuss? Yes, you can. Oh, okay. And it's Noom. Noom. <laughs> you know, these fucking Noom ads are always like entering my brain. I'm like, just, oh, get the fuck out. Um, but it's, it's hard to, you know, it's advertising. It's, I feel like it's science. Like they know how to like talk to us to make mm -hmm. us feel inadequate, not just about weight, but like job, uh, where we are in life, car, watch everything. It's, it's, they're, they're making money off of our insecurities, which they're giving us. Right. Yeah. That's absolutely true. Do you find, do you think that media is doing better now at accepting different body types? And do you see a difference in the way that mainstream media embraces body diversity versus porn? Do you think one does better than the other? Oh, great questions. Um, I think that porn embraces all different types because we know that there is someone out there who likes this. You know, I, I've never felt shamed in this, in the adult industry for my body or really anything. I feel like there's people know there's a value, um, to diversity. Um, your first question was super good, but I don't remember. And I have a bad habit of asking a couple of questions all at once, and I got to stop that. <laughs> it's good. Sorry. Um, yeah. Do you think that media has um, come oh, a yes, long way yes. from back, say, in the early 2000s? Yeah, I feel like they have shifted a little bit, but I, I'm not going to credit media. I'm going to credit social media, which is really driving change for all different aspects of, like, humanity, not just, you know, like, fatness. Um, but I think that since people have the uh, ability to just self-publish, basically, you know, like on social media, diversity is, you can't stop it. And advertisers and companies know that there's val monetary value behind like showing a more diverse uh, models or whatever in their advertisements or, or targeting different types of groups. Um, I'm going to credit social media, not media. Mm. Yeah, no, you're so right. It's like once the general public, I think, was able to 
harness the ability to put their opinions and feelings out there, which I feel like we really saw initially with porn because like once the internet came along and people could search for what they wanted as opposed to only being fed what they wanted through like magazines or whatever limited um, DVDs were at the store, um, that's when you saw like all these different tastes and niches come out and become incredibly popular. Absolutely. But by the way, what's a magazine? (laughs) (laughs) It's the internet made out of trees. (laughs) I miss magazines. (laughs) I know, right? It's uh, I, (laughs) a huge chunk of my income was from magazines at one point and it is no longer the case. Though I do sell um, the layout like every once in a while, but it's like, man, the the price that is paid is drastically less. (laughs) I mean, this is, you know. Yeah. The evolution of media, right? Mm -hmm. I have like so many bins full of magazines that I'm in, like either like in an ad or in an article or in the the cover. I'm just like, what am I going to do with this? Like, I'm not going to have kids. So they're just in my storage. You should keep them because one day they're going to become incredibly valuable because they're going to be like relics, right? (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) this is like dusty thing. Yeah, after after I die, like just go to my storage and eBay them, I guess. (laughs) I feel like there's a... You know, I feel like, you know how things always come full circle now with all this um, tech and us entering this new era of the metaverse and everything being digital, I think there will be an inherent value to tangible items. I think that that will become really valuable because it'll be something that people don't really get anymore. So I would hang on to those. I will. Thank you. Okay. (laughs) Um, So uh, I want to also talk about the fact that you're now working as an intimacy coordinator for mainstream movies and television. Um, I've, I've heard that this is a need that like more recently is looking to be fulfilled more often than before. So tell me about that experience and how you got into it. Excuse me. Burping. Sorry. No problem. Um, I was just certified on Thursday, so it hasn't been a week. Um, so yeah, intimacy coordinators for film and TV are much like, uh, stunt coordinators, Um, But we work specifically with nudity and simulated sex scenes. So our job is to um, be kind of like mediate the power dynamics between the production and the actor, which inherently there are lots because actors are trained to just say yes, get the job. You know, um, it's really wild to think that there wasn't this position didn't really, really exist until like 2018. So think about all the movies you've seen beforehand and all the sex simulated sex scenes you've seen and nudity. And that was just negotiated by the actors and directors. And if you think about it, you can just, well, I, if, when I think about it, I can just imagine like how many actors were put in really uncomfortable situations because of that power imbalance. Um, so yeah, I intimacy coordinators are there to just make sure that um, no boundaries are crossed, that all the actors are um, consenting to what's happening. So that all happens prior to shooting. It's pre-production. Um, and I got into it last year, last year because in December 2020, I was on a shoot. It was a small shoot. Uh, the person doing camera was was a friend of mine, not, not anymore. And I had a really bad experience. I, mm. my boundaries were crossed. I felt violated. It was a really shitty time. And I'm there like with 10 plus years experience in porn with a friend. So being vulnerable and having the discomfort that happened after that. And I was just like, venting with all my friends and my mom are just like oh my god and then a few months later like I saw um this school being advertised this class this course being advertised through Lotus Lane Mm. um so she's also you know she took the course with me I was like what is this a job like really so I was really inspired to take my negative experience that was pretty damaging actually I'm like I said I'm not friends with that person anymore um, and kind of like spin it and and have it be the catalyst for this new, um, you know, branch of my career. I feel like perf- porn performers are 
ideal for this role because we have been, like we were talking about earlier, vulnerable, fucking on camera in front of a crew of people. I like that part, right? Mm -hmm. But um, actors may not necessarily like that part. And I feel like since I've had to navigate and advocate for myself a lot, um, it just gives me a, a good set of skills to bring to this this role in, in film and TV. And um, the other day I was uh, shooting in Austin and Cinnamon Love was um, in the scene and Bodacious Beauty was her scene partner and it was going to be a BDSM scene and Cinnamon was like, why don't you IC for this? And I was like, okay. So I took the skills that I had learned for mainstream and I applied it to this uh, BDSM scene and I drew from my own knowledge of what happens during scenes and cinnamon was also it was a dialogue between all three of us but I was like damn I think this role can be really um skillfully applied to the porn industry I hope that it's something that becomes normalized well I was actually going to say so we so working for MindGeek um since the pandemic they've actually introduced a new role into my crew uh call and talent liaison it sounds like they almost oh. do the exact same thing Ooh. um they're there to advocate for the models uh -huh. um they're there for the models to speak to directly if they have any issues with the producer or the director to eliminate that power dynamic problem um, they're there to help go over the boundary checklist to make sure that no boundaries are crossed on set. They watch the scene, um, make sure the models got food. Like, uh, so it sounds like a pretty similar, similar job, but yeah. there's, yeah, I don't know if anybody else besides mind geek is actually doing that, but I was actually pretty impressed. Um, I've, I'd wanted a boundary checklist to be introduced into scenes for a long time because I just felt like that was a really good way to make sure that everybody was fully communicative about what they're okay with. Because I mean, you said that you had that experience with 10 plus years. You can imagine what it's like for a new girl who doesn't feel like they have the place or they don't know how to set boundaries and they feel nervous about saying like, you know, I don't know if I'm okay with that. Um, giving them a forum where it's like, okay, we want you to be very direct and specific about what you're okay with. Here's a checklist. Like everything is written out. You can put a yes, no, you can put a scale of one to 10. Like, wow. um, so it sounds like it's kind of a similar, a similar job. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a, it does sound like they're the same, um, same goals for sure. Just different title. Uh, yeah. And also, you know, these, some performers are really young and this is me to, you know, December, 2020, I'm in my forties, you know, 10 plus years in the industry working with a friend, like, and I still was in the performer mode of just like, okay, let's just get it shot. You yeah. know, we were fighting sunlight and all this bullshit. Yeah. So I was like, let's just get it done. But I'm, I'm really happy to hear that this is something mind geek is doing right now. HBO is the only like, um, company that requires an IC, but I, I just see, I just can see, feel like the trajectory is that more, uh, mainstream companies will hire this. And also like, it's for liability too. Like mm -hmm. if so, an IC or a performer advocate is on set, I would think that the director and a producer, whoever would feel a sense of ease of like, okay, nothing's going to, well, the chances of someone coming back and being like, actually I was harmed in this. Mm -hmm. The, during this shoot um, are minimized. Yeah, I mean, and also too, as the director and the producer, you have so many other things to think yeah, about. Right. You know, fighting sunlight <laughs> is like one of the my favorite things that sends me to a full-blown panic. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, so having somebody there who's specifically just to make sure that like no wires get crossed and everybody's on the same page is I think really helpful. So do they, now, so question, so, can you tell me a little bit more specifically? Because it's just interesting because, you know, in porn, like obviously we're there to have sex, right? We're there to like shoot sex happening. So like, you know, there's no misunderstanding about like a penis going in a vagina. Like all of that stuff's pretty basic. But like if it's an implied sex scene, I feel like there's more nuances that you have to worry about. Like what if the guy gets hard on? Like, is that a problem? Do they really wear like Merkins? Do they wear like these stickers over their orifices? Like yeah. how does that work? Yeah, there's all different types of modesty garments is what they're called. Um, like the strapless thong, you know, it's sticky. Um, I haven't worked much. Like I said, I'm just a week, not even a week certified. So I haven't really worked much on mainstream. 
But um, yeah, my instructor said that they've never encountered when someone does actually get aroused d during a scene. Like, I don't know how that would happen. Like for me, like once I'm next to someone, like I'm just like, ooh, I'm aroused. But also, like, I'm, I'm lucky. My, my um, <laughs> erection is internal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, so, and then with the simulated sex scenes, there's lots of different techniques that ICs can use to, like, um, for example, like a deflated Pilates ball to put in between each other mm. or a yoga mat, you know, to, like, yoga mats are kind of used to, you know, like, underwear shaped to, like, stop the... The friction, the skin rubbing. Okay. Um, blocking too. Like if you just, a cool thing that I, I because for our final, like we had to film a, a scene. And so I did like this BJ scene and, you know, the, the first performer was, the person wearing the dick was standing up and the other performer was in front of them. But I just stood behind both of them and just with the right angle and the, the person, you know, giving the blowjob was just like doing that. And from, you know, behind, you can't tell. Mm. So it's a lot of like clever angles and um, just tricks that. Uh, yeah, it's true. Because like with fight scenes, which I've had to coordinate for a couple of scenes, um, they obviously don't actually hit each other. And it's all about angles and. Um, like adding the sounds is actually what makes it seem a lot more realistic. Cool. And I think our brains too, like they fill in, our brains fill in the gap of like, okay, maybe when we're watching the thing and we're like, okay, yeah, it's a blowjob. It's a fight scene. Um, I think our brain just wants to like go with it. If we're already immersed in that world mm -hmm. then we'll just go with it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I want to go back to the adult industry. Yeah. Um, you mentioned your mom earlier. Do how does your whole family know about what you do? Was that a hard conversation to have? Have they accepted it? Yeah, my whole family knows. Um, they we never talk about my work. They just know that I'm you know traveling and staying busy. Um, the the hardest person to come out with to come out to was my mom. My dad had passed away by the time I entered. So I didn't have to deal with that, which I don't know how I would have dealt with that. But um, after I made like two or three movies, I was like, I better tell my mom before, like maybe someone will tell her. I don't know. Yeah. So I just, you know, I was super nervous. Like I was just like, you know, like crying a little bit, like, okay, mom, you know, like, and at the time Carlos was directing porn. So she knew I was kind of like in that world. Like mm -hmm. she knew my friends did it and I was doing makeup on some of Carlos's sets. So I was like, mom, you know, like what Carlos shoots. And she's like, yeah, I'm like, okay, well, sometimes I come out in those things. And she's like, okay, well, you know how I feel about that, which I don't. And still to this day, I don't. <laughs> But <laughs> well, when someone says, you know how I feel about that, it's usually not, doesn't mean I'm really stoked on it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's like, I think she just, what she has said, she said, I'm an adult and I'm going to make my own decisions. But I think that she's seen that I've had a very rich and um, successful career and I've had so many opportunities that I would not have had if I were not in porn. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think that's what she focuses on. That's good. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, it just kind of goes both ways. I've talked to so many people whose families accept what they do, but they don't necessarily talk about the details, which is totally understandable. And then other people who've been like completely, you know, cut off from their families. And I just, I always feel so terrible for them because I know how hard that is. Yeah, that must be so hard. Yeah. Yeah. Have you found that the um, stigma of porn has affected you in other ways in your personal life? Like even like just day to day or financial? Yeah, the the stigma that uh, sex work has is huge. Where I'm, where I have found the most difficulties is, um, you know, I'm um, when I'm single, uh, just meeting people. Like, to, like when do I tell them? And uh, you know, ultimately, when I do tell them, their their perception of me changes. You know, there's um, only a, f in my experience, there's only been a handful of people who are able to, um, deal with it. Um, I've had a lot of partners, specifically cis men who once were in bed together, they just kind of get in their head of like, Oh, you've had like, you know, they just, they, <laughs> they fuck with their own brain and they can't like stay hard because they're just thinking about me fucking on set, which is like, it's not even, 
I go, you're in my bed. Like, you know, like, it's no issue. You know, like, I'm not, it's not the same. Like, you know, like shooting in somewhere like this on a psych like this in a room with lights. Like, it's not the same as when we're in bed and I'm wanting to connect with this person. So, yeah, and in my personal, like, dating life, it does present mm -hmm. a problem. Yeah. Um, what is the one thing that you would like people to know about the adult industry? Maybe, like, the biggest misconception that you'd like to dispel? Um, that we are not all victims. I mean, there's victims in every industry, right? Mm -hmm. Teachers, well, respected industries, right? Um, we, we are very business minded people. We're very, uh, progressive. We are really, um, as much as infighting as there is, there is totally like, this is all my ex personal experience, but. Um, there's such a sense of um, family and camaraderie and just having each other's back. Like, um, so yeah, those are some of the things. We're not these vapid sex machines. Like we have goals and um, a lot of us complete the goals. I don't complete my goals all the time, but um, I'm not just this like, piece of shit person just with spread with legs sprayed open all the time just like waiting for someone to enter me like we have different like very rich lives yeah I and mean, I think that that's one thing that I've I mean obviously like I started this podcast because I knew sex workers as such like rich interesting dynamic people but hosting this podcast and having people like you on to talk about your individual experiences I think has been an even more like enriching education and like just you know the like you guys are just people and you have a job that maybe society views as different and unusual but um that doesn't like devalue you from humanity at all so yeah 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 thank you for this um this outlet and this voice thank you yeah. well thank you for coming on oh my god thanks for having me <laughs> giving us your voice <laughs> Um, can you tell everybody where they can find you online, your social media handles, websites, whatever you want to plug? Thank you. Um, so if you want to join my OnlyFans, it's onlyaprilflores.com. Um, my Twitter for now, while it's up. Oh, no, no. My Twitter's good. My Instagram for now, while it's still around, is the April Flores with uh, two E's, T-H-E-E, -E, April Flores with an S. Uh, Twitter is the April Flores, which is with one E. And yeah, I mean, I should have a website. I should have all this shit together. I'm working on it. <laughs> Just Google me. <laughs> <laughs> and you guys can find me at Holly Randall on Instagram and on Twitter. And you can, of course, support this podcast by going to patreon.com slash Holly Randall Unfiltered, where you will be able to watch live streams like this one right now, way before the episode is actually released to the public, plus a bunch of other fun bonus content. Thank you guys so much for joining us and I'll see you next week.